The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, we could say that uh, because of the fall of man, the beginning, that um, so much was lost. And our Lord came to restore all that had been lost. And so it's very uh, interesting to think about how a church is built and how it's consecrated and what it is for. Now there are photos of the uh, laying of the cornerstone here, which happened on October 24th, 1924. The laying of the cornerstone shows, uh, the photo shows the, uh, the walls at the corner of the front of the building built up about maybe five, six feet uh, across and around the corner. And the cornerstone, you can see it out there. If you look, it's behind the bushes there, but it's a little marble cornerstone with the date. And, uh, and so what happens on that day is that a cross is placed where the altar will be. So the designs, the architect had already designed the building. We have the blueprints for the original church building, for this church building. And a cross is placed then in the place where the high altar will be for the remainder of the time. So a cross was placed here. And that sets the cornerstone and the place where the sanctuary will be. And then the, the land and the place has to be reclaimed for the Lord. From the very beginning, it has to be reclaimed. And so there is a ceremony around uh, the, the claiming of the land. You know, you, you can think about how explorers, explorers would uh, plant the flag of the monarch of the country who had uh, sponsored them, and uh, they claimed the land. You could... You could uh, think about how an American flag was, was placed uh, on the moon and uh, as claiming it, whatever that means. <laughs> if you can claim a, 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 another planet I, uh, for a particular country, well, I don't know. But, uh, but certainly, we claimed this space for the Lord and for his church because our Lord has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, in order to do so, the gospel must be preached, the holy sacrifice must be offered, and that is all part of, uh, of missionary activity. Now, we've been, looking at, we've been looking at the nine choirs of angels and how they are related to even just the architecture of a church and how we can... Uh, be reminded of each of the nine choirs of angels by the, uh, by the various things in a church, and then that relates to us. So for those of you who were not here Friday uh, for the Feast of St. Michael, those of you who didn't follow along with the Novena, it's worth repeating, uh, and it, even if you were, it's worth repeating to then relate it in this new way. So we looked at, and this is not, you know, this is not dogmatic, but this is just a, a, a reflection on the nine choirs of angels. It's not set in stone, but it's a good way for us to understand and to think of them. It's a helpful way that we can consider that uh, God created the invisible and the visible creation, the visible, the, the invisible creation, the rational creatures are angels and that they are considered uh, in the church to be nine choirs of angels which, uh, which all serve God in a particular way. Now, there are countless numbers of angels that we couldn't even begin to fathom the number of angels that are, uh, that are created and that exist, uh, but we can understand... Um, how the angels serve God, and then that helps us to understand how we must serve God. So we, we, we might begin then with the candles on the high altar, which are a flame, and we think about the tongues of fire on the candles on the altar, and we could relate those to the seraphim, which are the angels associated with fire, and the fire communicates the love of God, his light and his warmth, also the light of the intellect, 
and of knowledge, the light in the darkness. And so we have the candles on the high altar. We also have the candle here, the sanctuary lamp, which hangs from the ceiling, and that indicates that our Lord is present on his throne here in the tabernacle, the Eucharistic Lord. So we start then with the candles, remind us of the seraphim. Now the seraphim are, are said to be those closest to God on the throne, and that the highest hierarchy is, consists of the seraphim, the cherubim, and the thrones, and these are all equal, but that they are the closest to God of all the other angels. So we could say that the, um, since the cherubim are described as the chariots of God, and that he rides upon the, the cherubim, well, we could consider then that the tabernacle itself could be considered, uh, to, could remind us of the cherubim, and then the throne would be the altar upon which the Lord uh, is seated. Then we move on to the second hierarchy, the middle hierarchy. And this hierarchy is the dominions, the, um, the, the powers, and the virtues. Now there is, and there is a little bit of uh, variance. Sometimes the virtues are placed above the powers, but I'm following the order that we used in the chaplet of St. Michael. So the dominions are said to, um, to govern from the or to preside from the steps of the throne of God. So we have the steps here in the sanctuary leading up to the throne of God. The powers then hold the spirits of wickedness and subjection. And we could associate the powers then with this outer part of the sanctuary where the ceremonies of the various liturgies are carried out, the divine office, uh, some of the sacraments, and the mass. And so the ceremonies are ordered, they're obedient, they are holy, and so uh, as the powers hold the spirits of wickedness and subjection, there's no place for them here. There's no place for anything wicked here, there's no place for anything disobedient here. This is a place that is to be well-ordered, holy, and obedient to the ceremonies and the rubrics and the rites of the church. Well, then we have the virtues, and the virtues are entrusted with the preservation of species, with nature's laws, and um, oh, what was that last thing? Oh, and the movement of the heavens. So we could associate the virtues then with this place just at the communion rail or just inside the communion rail. As, uh, as they look out upon all of creation from heaven and, uh, and are entrusted with the movement of the heavens, the preservation of species, and nature's laws. So right here at the threshold of heaven and earth. Now on the other side of the communion rail, then we begin with the third hierarchy, the lowest hierarchy, which is the closest to man. So the highest hierarchy is closest to God, and the lowest hierarchy is closest to man. <clears throat> now this hierarchy is made up of principalities, archangels, and angels. So the principalities are um, governed over, or are entrusted over the entire human race, and in particularly over nations, and over larger social bodies like nations, and the various churches. Now by churches, we would refer to the various dioceses. The dioceses uh, of, of the world. We're not talking about different churches because there's only one church. There's only one church. So, that, so um, we can't begin dividing that into uh, various like denominations or beliefs or religions. Rather, there's one church. But there are 24, approximately 24 different rites of the Catholic Church, liturgical rites, east and west. So we could say, perhaps, that the principalities are entrusted with those, the various rites of the church, or perhaps the various dioceses. 
Then we have the archangels. Now the archangels are considered as ambassadors between the principalities and the angels. And the archangels are entrusted over smaller communities. So perhaps we could say that the archangels are entrusted over parishes and over particular parish churches. And then we could look at just how a parish church is divided in its architecture between the inner sanctuary, the outer sanctuary, the nave, the narthex, the piazza, and then out to the rest of the world, and then the other various parts of the, of the property. But as far as the church building goes, we have these various um, sections which communicate something. They communicate something about the hierarchy uh, between heaven and earth and the intersection between heaven and earth. Then the angels themselves are, the, are said to be the guardians of individual men. And each of us is assigned a guardian angel from the time of our conception. And that guardian angel is with, with us in the womb. The battle begins when we are born. All right, so there's a summary of what we spoke about the other day. When we speak about the, the building and the dedication and the consecration of a church then, we, we begin where that leaves off. Because even as we're considering how these various things in this church can remind us of the nine choirs of angels, even so, these are just reminders of the nine choirs of angels. But this church building is to be a reminder of things heavenly while we are here on earth. And uh, when we consider how a church is built, we can't see anything of nature in here. Everything, uh, our view of nature is obscured. So all we can see in here are things that are heavenly. We don't have clear windows in a church. If we had clear windows in a church, we would see outside to this world. And the whole reason for having obscuring windows, and sometimes you'll see in old churches, you'll see alabaster windows where light comes through, but you don't see the outside world. It's very typical that you would see stained glass windows where you see you see through the light that shines through them, but you see salvation history. So we are contained here in a special way that, uh, that is sometimes referred to as that of a ship. So we have the nave, and the word for nave, so the nave is this section here where people sit, and that comes from navis, which is uh, Latin for a ship. And we have naval officers, and navy men who are in ships on the sea. So we see uh, often in a church architecture an inverted ship where if you look up to the ceiling, you're reminded of the, the bottom of a ship. And so it is taking us through the waters, the stormy waters and turbulent waters of this world. We are enclosed, we are protected, we can, almost, uh, we can almost consider it uh, also as a womb the, where we are protected in this life as we are being prepared for the next life. So we have reminders of heaven here in the sanctuary and we have reminders of the earth, but um, an earth that is protected like the Ark of, of Noah that took... Uh, that, that one family, the just man and his family, and the both clean and unclean animals through the deluge of the flood. And they were saved through water. And so we are saved through water. Now you'll see in the narthex then, but not in the nave, at the very opening of the church building, we have the baptistry. So that when we baptize either babies or adults, we start outside in the piazza, outside of the doors, and then we're brought into the church or, and baptized there before we enter the nave. Well, there are all sorts of things we can consider here that are symbolic. 
and reminders of the world beyond, we have the 12 apostles up along the ceiling. We have, uh, we have the firmament of heaven here, and then we have the higher heaven above, you know, above the baldacchino, the canopy. The canopy shows that something sacred is happening underneath because everything sacred is covered. The altar is covered with a canopy because it is the place of the nuptials of the lamb with his bride. And uh, as, uh, as a Jewish wedding is performed under a canopy, so the mass is performed or enacted or uh, represented under a canopy. All right, all that having been said, now we consider the ecclesiastical hierarchy, which picks up where the celestial hierarchy leaves off. We have the nine choirs of angels that bring the light and the fire and the warmth of love and his commands and his will and communicate that all down through the nine choirs of angels to the angels who then communicate it to men. And that is where the ecclesiastical hierarchy begins. Now, when we speak about ecclesiastical hierarchy, that refers to every human being on earth. It doesn't necessarily refer to the pope, the cardinals, the bishops, the monsignors, the priests, the pastors, the vicars, the religious, and the laity. Although we are all part of that ecclesiastical hierarchy, but Dionysius the Areopagite, who writes and uh, gives us, uh, passes down to us the tradition of the celestial and ecclesiastical hierarchy, notes that it doesn't just mean we're members of the church, but every human being is part of the ecclesiastical hierarchy, whether they like it or not, whether they believe in God or not, whether they've been baptized or not. Now, that doesn't mean they're members of the church, but it means that they have been created and they're governed by the ecclesiastical hierarchy. In other words, that all humanity, all humanity is meant to be brought into the church. All humanity is, um, is meant to be baptized and belong to Holy Mother Church. And we all have our place in that. And we're either, now as far as the, the the Catholic Church goes, we're either inside it or we're outside of it. But as far as humanity goes, God has a plan for all humanity. It goes back to Adam and Eve. That was interrupted by original sin, the deluge, purified the earth. But there's a covenant with Noah and his sons which extends to all humanity. It's a covenant that God has made with all humanity. He will, not, he will not destroy the world by a flood again, but he will come to judge the living and the dead in the world by fire. And just as we are baptized into new life by water and the Holy Ghost, so it is that the fire of Pentecost, the fire of the Holy Ghost, we receive that at confirmation. And we will be purified by that same fire after our death. So it is that the world will be purified by fire, which is a scary thing, but is also a very holy thing. The fire of the seraphim, which communicates the fire of the Holy Ghost, God who is an all-consuming fire. Well, it is a scary thing, but it is also a holy thing and something to be hopeful of. Now, this church was consecrated or dedicated with holy water and with ashes and with wine and with oil. It is a reflection of the Christian life. Baptism, ashes, we have Ash Wednesday, which is penitence. We have the, the anointing with oil, a baptism and confirmation. And, um, and the wine, which is a sign of the Eucharist. 
It's a sign of the spiritual life. So all of that is involved in the dedication of this church, which reflects our own souls. This church is beautiful. It's holy. It's set apart. It is not to be profaned. And that is a sign of our, old, our own souls after baptism. Our souls after baptism are beautiful. They're holy. They're not to be profaned. They're to be kept neat and tidy and obedient, keeping spirits of wickedness in subjection. Everything we've considered up here, according to the nine choirs of angels, has to do with us, our service to God our worship of God, our obedience to God, our protection by God, hearing the will of God and the word of God and keeping it. And that, that is what our life is about. So it is helpful that we have this church. It is helpful that we understand this church, that we understand how God has created intelligent beings, the angels, and human beings, and is a great mystery. And we need, to know, we need to know our faith, and we need to be constantly growing in our faith and pondering over the faith and pondering over all these great mysteries of God to understand what God wants from us. On one hand, it's very simple what God wants from us, but he's given us brains, he's given us intellects, so that we can consecrate our intellects to God. It's what, it's what we have in common with angels. Angels have only the intellect and the will. They don't have the bodies. We have bodies and intellect and free will in order to serve God. Well, that opens up all sorts of other topics of, and mysteries to be pondered over. This is just the beginning. And I hope what I have done has inspired you to know more. Because we need to be studying our faith and pondering over these mysteries and spending time in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament as the angels do. And in that, we have a life to live in service to God. Let us imitate the holy angels. Let us be inspired by this church. Let us be aware of the temple that is our body and how we may imitate this church. Amen.